Hello, how's everyone doing today? The purpose of this video is to give a brief history of control systems. The, the lecture notes or the slides and the content is based on information provided in the textbook Chemical and Bioprocess Control, 4th edition, by James Riggs and Nazmul Kareem. Okay, so it's important to understand the brief history of control systems because when you graduate with your chemical engineering degree, you might work on processes that, or you may work on control systems that were designed using technology that was available at the time and not technology as we know it today. If you were going to start from scratch and design a control system, you would probably use field bus technology because that's, you know, that's what most of the electronic components um, work with now. Field bus technology, uh, multiple components are compatible, each component has um, a microprocessor, you have two-way communication between the variety of components within the control loop. You have more of this plug-and-play um, adaptation of electronics that we're currently used, used to. You know, as you might also expect, information can be readily shared across uh, the variety of processes in the plant. So the decisions for the controller can incorporate a significant amount of information. This isn't always the case. Once upon a time, we didn't even have electronics. And control systems were actually based on pneumatic systems, where air was the signal that was sent to the control valve or sent through the plant using um, air lines. So in the 1920s, the majority of processes, or, or a lot of manual processes, were replaced with pneumatic control systems. Um, and this also, in, in addition to having the pneumatic control valves, for example, you could have pneumatic controllers where air flowed through the plant and you can observe a variety of processes from a single place, like a controller. In the 1950s, electronic analog components, so in the 1950s, electronic start starting to become available with the development of you know, transistors, resistors, and capacitors. And instead of using air signals through the plant, uh, wires could be used to transmit signals. Okay, supervisory control systems are essentially a combination of these electronic analog systems. And the first one was introduced in 1959. And this was incorporated with um, oil refinery type processes. In the 1970s, uh, distributed control systems were developed, and distributed. The advantage there is that distributed control systems are based on uh, digital signals. So, um, a variety of different components could be integrated together in ways that allowed for information sharing, data storage, troubleshooting, etc. Um, and now, currently today, field bus technology is in development and being incorporated into control systems. So some brief information about pneumatic control systems is shown here. Um, the, the general idea is that we have air that's going to be the signal that's sent to the valve and also sent through the entire control process. So air is transported through pipes, it goes to valves, and you have these systems that are developed based on bellows, baffles, and nozzles. And they use compressed air to integrate PID or control action into the control loop. Some additional information is also given on this slide. So here's an example of a process control diagram that shows how a pneumatic control system might work. All right, so for this example, we're going to show a thermal mixer. So in the stream entering, we have flow of one and temperature of stream one. And what you can see is the valve shown here controls the flow of this stream into the thermal mixer. We also have a stream two that has a flow rate at a given temperature associated with it. These two streams are mixed together in this tank, so it's considered to be well mixed, and we have a combined flow and temperature coming out. In this unit, there's a thermal couple that's integrated into a thermal well on the exit stream that can measure the temperature. So what we see here is that the thermal couple gives a millivolt signal. There's a transmitter incorporated into this process that converts the, mill the millivolt signal from the thermal couple into an air pressure. And so what that transmitter will do is it'll take instrument air and it'll convert that to a 3 to 15 PSI G signal. 3 to 15 PSI 
is the industrial standard for uh, compressed air that's used within control systems, control valves, etc. So the signal from the, the, from the transmitter will go to a pneumatic controller. So in the pneumatic controller, it's going to work a, a similar way. It's going to have air, instrument air, that goes into the controller. Uh, the, the control operator or user can enter a set point, so a target set point. So essentially, if you think about how this controller works, is this set point entered is converted into a air signal, 3 to 15 PSIG. So that signal is compared to the air signal from the thermocouple. And based on the difference between the set point and the measured value of the temperature, the controller will send an air pressure or a change in an air pressure to this valve to tell the valve to open or close in order to change the flow rate of this stream to get back to the initial, or to get back to the target temperature. Right, so the, the benefit of the pneumatic controllers is, is for one, you can, you can change valves, you can change the valve position fairly easily and accurately without having a, a, an operator there to turn the valve. Uh, also of importance is the, air, the, the measurement signals can be transported through the plant using air lines. So there are pipes that have air flowing through them that can all be transported to a single, to a single room where an engineer can monitor multiple processes and make changes at, a, uh, at the same time. Okay, in the, in the 1950s with the development, with the early stage development of uh, electronics, such as resistors, capacitors, and transistors, uh, PID control and transmission of signals could be done now using wires and electrical signals instead of air signal. So obviously a wire relative to an airline is significantly cheaper. The use of the electronic signals also allows some development or some integration of advanced uh, levels of controls beyond just PID feedback in that ratio feed forward and, and other methods could be incorporated. Okay, let's now look at the same process control diagram that we looked at previously but now using the electronic controllers rather than pneumatic controllers. Okay, and again, many, many things are the same. We have a thermocouple that's giving us a millivolt signal. The transmitter now converts that millivolt signal into a current signal. So just like 3 to 15 PSIG is used for the air, is the industrial standard for the air pressure range, 4 to 20 is the standard for the current range that's delivered from transmitters to the controllers or from controllers to other components of a control system. So electronic signal is sent to the controller. The controller takes a set point temperature, right? This temperature set point is converted into a milliamp signal. These milliamp signals are compared together and the electronic con and the electronic controller gives a current output signal. Okay. Now in these cases, at, at this time, valves cannot, could not be controlled using electronics, so the valve was still controlled by using air pressure. So the current signal that was sent from the electronic controller to the valve went through an IP converter. So an IP converter converts current into pressure and is connected to instrument air. So the IP converter converts a 4 to 20 milliamp signal into a 3 to 15 PSIG, PSIG signal, and this air pressure will open or close the valve as needed in order to get the measured temperature equal to the temperature set point as given. So because we have these two standards for current and pressure, one of the things that we'll, be able, that we'll need to do is we'll need to convert, we'll need to know how to convert between the milliamp and the PSIG signal. Okay, so the electronic control systems are all based on an analog signal, which are which is a, a continuous signal that count that goes from the transmitter to the controller. The controller outputs a continuous signal to the IP converter, and the IP converter delivers a continuous air pressure signal to the valve to keep the valve in the desired position. So in the end of the 1950s, early 1960s, supervisory computer control systems were developed. These systems combined a variety of electronic analog systems um, in a way where information could be easily shared. The main problem with these types of systems is all of the controllers were connected to a single computer. 
therefore it had major reliability issues. So there, you could have redundant computer systems set up, but still reliability was an issue because everything was connected together. If one component failed, the entire system would have to be down. Okay, so how this looks in a, in a, on a diagram. We have, you can see there is a supervisory computer control in the middle, and connected to this are all the video displays, alarms, printers, for example, to print out uh, measurement or information for later troubleshooting. You have data storage, and then you have interfacing hardware that's connected with the computer control systems. Okay, now with the development of distributed control systems, we're starting to approach the, um, the level of control that we would be, that we would develop if we were going to do such a thing today. So the, the DCS, distributed control systems, were developed in the 1970s. These systems involved or integrated redundant microprocessors, so each individual control system could effectively have its own control loop. Um, the data was stored digitally, so the analog signals from the transmitter were converted to a digital signal, and these digital signals were stored and processed um, within a central unit and used by the controllers to, to, to control processes individually. So here's, a, here's the same figure again shown for a distributed control system. Now this is very similar to this is very similar to the supervisory control or electronic analog, except for a couple important differences. We can see on here we have these AD devices. These are analog to digital converters. So the analog signal from the transmitter is converted into a digital signal. Like we said earlier, analog is a continuous signal. Digital is discrete individual measurements or individual um, or, or digital signals are discrete values or discrete data. So data points taken every you know half a second, second, etc. So the digital signals are delivered to the DCS computer. The DCS computer is connected to the operator console. So the operator console can control the individual unit. So on the, the DCS computer will also collect information from other parts of the process that can be used to help control for the given process. The controller output from the DCS is converted to another, or goes through another now digital to analog conversion. So the di digital signal is converted to analog. Now the analog delivers a continuous signal to the IP converter, which delivers an air pressure to the valve to open or close to keep it at the uh, desired position in order to maintain the flow needed to keep the temperature at its set point. The prime, again, like we, like we mentioned, the primary benefits of the DCS systems is that the information is, um, the information is shared between different control loops. Systems are not independent from each other. And it's very easy to build on or add to um, a, a given system. Whereas in the supervisory control, uh, redesign of the process would require redesign of the entire control system. On this, on this last slide, what we're useful or what we're used to working with so far in chemical engineering is design of processes. So we look at, we have flows and temperatures coming into the process. The process has some, some model associated it, mass or energy balances, and then there's uh, flows and temperatures. So you have mass and energy in, mass and energy out. We can do, we can do process design to determine steady state conditions. When we're talking about process control, we also, in addition to thinking about the models for the processes, we have to also develop models for the individual components of the process to see how changes in, for example, temperature or changes in respect to flow or temperature over here affect the process so that the, so that we, so that the controller knows how to open and close this valve to keep the process at its desired set point. So understanding the flow of information through the system is extremely important. And so let's look at let's look at that now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this same process in a slightly different way, and I'll come back and I'll show how that's related to each other. So in here uh, we have our process. Okay. So going into the process we have flow one. Right, and I'm going to draw it this way specifically so we can discuss some of the differences. 
incorporate in, in Stream 1. Stream 1 also has a uh, temperature associated with it. Also entering into the process, we have another stream, and this stream will have a temperature uh, and a flow associated with it. Okay, coming out of this process is going to be a temperature and a flow. Okay, so again, as we want to look at, that's, that's how the, the process works in order for, in, to, to consider the, the material energy balances. So in this process, the temperature, right, so the temperature is coming out of the process, and that's defined based on the model how the process works. This temperature is going to be sent to a sensor, and the sensor is going to convert the temperature into a sensed value. So the, the, temp, the temperature, or the, the sensed temperature, is not always going to be the same as the temperature. Right? Eventually, if everything's at steady state and it's calibrated, these two values will be the same. But temperature or sensors and other components are going to have a dynamic component to them, which means is that if one thing changes, if the input changes, the output will eventually change, but it, it, there's a time scale associated with the change of that parameter. Okay, so this parameter, the measured value, is going to be compared with a temperature set point. All right, and this is going to give us an error, which is sent to our controller. Okay, so we can we could almost consider even that this set point. All right, so the difference between the set point and the measured value is going to be an error. And the, computer, the controller will take that error, and it'll have a controller, and I'm going to call this controller output. All right, this controller output is going to be sent to an actuator. Right? And then the actuator, which would be a valve, is going to deliver the flow to the process. Okay, so in here, now if we think about what this is, this flow is going to be something like gallon per minute, right? We have this temperature over here, maybe it's degree C. This measured value over here coming out, it's going to be in degree C. But the actual thing that's being delivered by the sensor transmitter is going to be a milliamp signal, right? So the signal that enters into the controller will be a milliamp signal. The set point will also be degree C, but it'll be converted to a milliamp signal such that these two signals can be compared together to give an error, which is also a milliamp signal. The controller will take that error, and this controller could do have some sort of P, PI or PID algorithm, and it's going to convert this error into a controller output, which is a milliamp. Right? This controller output is going to go to the actuator. It actually is going to go through an IP converter where it converts the current to an air pressure. That air pressure is going to move the valve, and the valve and the, the, the movement of the valve stem is going to cause a change in the flow rate going to the process. All right, so this, this exemplifies how the information travels through the system. All right, so this term F1, right, this is our manipulated variable, so this is a variable that we can change. This term right here, T, is our control variable. Right? This term, TS, is our measured value. Right? But we also have a couple other, we, there's, a, there's a few other things that are important in this process as well. Right? Notice that we have temperature 1, temperature 2, F2. These are all terms that can affect the process. Right? Because flow 1 is our manipulated variable, what our controller needs to do, or what our contr the controller is going to function by telling this flow to change based on a measured value in the temperature. So effectively what the controller is doing is it's going to convert a change in temperature to a change in flow. And so we have to, we have to understand how the process models work in order to be able to do that. These other variables, T1, T2, and F2, are called disturbances. Okay, so disturbances can also affect the process. 
right? So the changes in flow rates or the temperatures of the entering streams are going to affect the temperature of the process, right? But based on those, based on the temperature change of the process, the controller is going to take that difference and it's going to open or close the valve to change flow one to, to compensate for any temperature changes that are a result of these other three parameters that can affect the process. All right, the last thing I want to do here is just dive in a little bit deeper into how the actual actuator works. So if we think about the actuator, what we said earlier is that the controller is going to output a signal, and we're going to call this controller output. All right, this controller output is going to enter in an IP converter, and this IP converter is going to give us an air pressure. Okay, this air pressure will be a 3 to 15 PSI G signal. Okay, this this air pressure, the, the, the air pressure is going to go into, or it's going to, it enters into the top of the valve. Alright, so we can call the, we'll call this valve. And so this is going to change the valve position. I'm going to say, I'm going to call X valve position. Typically, for a properly designed control valve, the uh, for properly contrived or designed control valve, the valve position will go from 15% to 85% open. All right, we'll talk about that in another video why that's the case. Okay, so now as the valve changes from as the valve changes its valve position. Maybe this is the valve baffles, or the top of the valve. And then this goes to the valve body, right? And so what comes out of the valve, this is going to be the flow. In this case, we have F1. So F1 will vary between the min and the max flow. And those are going to be associated with the 15 to 85% open. So this is, in real, this is in actuality, how the actuator actually works. And so it's important to understand this because we can change the controller, we can change the valve manually. For example, we can change, we can, we can, we might provide a user set point for the controller output. We could step the controller output, that will change the air pressure, which changes the valve position, which changes the flow rate. We might have a manual valve where we can directly change the valve position by changing the valve which directly affects the flow rate. So any one of these, any, any number of these terms can be the input into the valve, and typically the flow rate is going to be the variable that, it's going to be the output variable, the variable that we affect by changing the valve. All right, so that was a little bit of a detour from our brief history so that we could discuss in a little bit of detail how the control system actually works or how information goes through the control loop within the control system. Okay, I want to come back to the DCS. So here's an ex here's uh, shown on this slide is a schematic of how information is integrated into a DCS control system. Okay, so in the middle here you can see there's a data highway, so there's shared communication across the entire facility or multiple facilities. The um, connected to the connected to the data highway are going to be system con system consoles in which users can access or engineers can access the control systems. There can be a host computer that has data storage. Okay, and then um, these, the, the, this data is connected to local control units. So local control units are the, the local control units required to control individual components of the process are share data back and forth with the DCS system, right? And what this shows here is you can have multiple different local control units, each of which has its own local console, All right? So the local console will connect, it will be connected to the local control unit. This will get information and give information to the, the DCS host computer. And based on the information that's gathered from the host computer and the information that comes from the local console, the local control unit will tell the process transmitters and actuators how to change in order to achieve the control objective that's necessary. 
want to note one thing on this slide while we're here is up in the what would that be your right hand corner is what's called a PLC and this is a programmable logic controller so we're not going to we're going to skip over the discussion of programmable logic controllers but essentially these are controllers that use what's called ladder logic so ladder logic is something that would be useful for things such as um, reactor startup, uh, reactor shutdown, batch operation, any, any sort of startup. And so the way that ladder logic type systems work is it goes through a series of logic commands, such as you know, fill the reactor until it reaches a level of target level, add steam to the reactor until it reaches a temperature of target temperature, um, add reactant component one until a certain outcome is achieved. And these types of programmable, so these types of programmable logic or controllers can be integrated with a variety of different aspects of DCS systems fairly seamlessly. Okay, one important consideration for DCS systems is that the DCS measurements are cyclical. Again, data is, data is stored digitally so that every time increment, every given time increment, the controller will take measurement values, run a calculation, send that to a controller and the controller will actuate or the controller will ask the actuator for a particular change. So because this is a cyclical process that's based on discrete measurements, there has to be a time scale associated with the calculations. And so that would be the cycle times. So as explained here, the shortest cycle times can, might, might be about a fifth of a second where many loops might be closer to a half of a second to one second. The, this can have an implication on the processes depending on how fast the control loop is for a given process. Right? So you might have fast control loops that um, the controller asks for a change and the response of the process is very fast on the order of a couple seconds. Right? But there might be processes where the change is actually quite slow, whereas if you ask, uh, or on a heating process where you ask like a, a, a heater to um, add heating input into the process. There's going to be there's going to be a little bit of a delay between when the change was asked for and when the process response is actually achieved. Okay, as we can, as we go further in this class, we're going to start working on process models where we'll we'll look at we'll start to understand the dynamics of the different components and we'll see why flow control loops are actually much faster than temperature control loops. Based on your understanding of these processes, you might be able to suspect why this is true already. Another advantage of DCS loops is it, troubleshooting is very easy. This is because the data is stored is readily available and can be accessed by users and examined and evaluated. We mentioned some of the benefits of the programmable logic controllers. If you wish, you can pause and read through these. Finally, I want to end with a few comments on field bus technology. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, field bus technology is essentially how we would consider electronics today. I, in previous systems like DCS and uh, supervisory computer control systems, there is a lot of challenges with compatibility. So you may be familiar with compatibility challenges between, for example, Mac and Windows-based computers. You have to have a specific program for the specific computer. Um, also, you can't use Android apps on your iPhone or iPhone apps on your Android, there is compatibility issues between the software and the programs. Maybe you might think about Xbox or PlayStation. Each system requires a specific set of hardware or software or games, etc., to run on a certain system. With field bus technology, it eliminates a lot of the compatibility issues because individual components have their individual microprocessor where they can communicate back and forth using uh, fast communication systems like a local area network. 